everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our Missouri Trailblazers program on Rose O'Neill, brought to you today by the Missouri State Museum. My name is Pam. I'm the branch lead here at the Holt Summit Public Library, which is a branch of the Daniel Boone Regional Library. Joining me today is Lauren, who is the Adult and Community Services Manager for Daniel Boone. Hi, Lauren. Hi, Pam. Hi, everyone. Today's program is a continuation of our Missouri Trailblazers series featuring trailblazers who have impacted Missouri. I would like to say a special thank you to the Missouri State Museum for their partnership in organizing these presentations. Today's program is about Rose O'Neill. This afternoon, we welcome Angela Wells. Angela is the Education and Outreach Specialist for the Missouri State Museum and the Jefferson Landing State Historic Site a public historian and advocate for integrating local history into the classroom. She is currently a graduate student at Missouri State University where she studies history. Aside from her obsession with everything historical, Angela is a mother, partner, and a frequent visitor to the Missouri Ozarks. Thank you everyone for being here and now I'll turn things over to Angela. Thanks Pam. Um, first, before I begin my presentation, I'm going to go over um, some of the things that are happening at the Missouri State Museum event-wise. Um, my colleague who is going to share this information um, is a little under the weather, so I'm just going to kind of read through some of the notes that she's supplied me. Um, so thank you, first of all, everyone for joining us today for the Missouri Trailblazers program on Rose O'Neill. I'm very excited to be here. Um, and I hope you like the information I get to share with you today. Um, we at the Missouri State Museum have a lot of amazing things in the works that we would love for all of you to be a part of. Um, first is the exciting changes at the Jefferson Landing State Historic Site. We're currently in the middle of extensive renovations of the third and final room in the museum space. Previously, this space housed only a large audio, visual, audio video screen and rows of wooden benches. This room will now not only have a smaller uh, video viewing space, but will also highlight jobs held by citizens of the landing over the course of history. Jobs such as telegraph operator, shoemaker, and washerwoman will be depicted in not only interpretive panels, but in hands-on interactive exhibits. This will merge well with our main room, which is set up as an 1850s general store. Our goal is to not only leave our visitors with a more memorable visit, but to offer experiences that serve as an educational tool for learning the rich history of Lowman's Landing and honoring the, the diversity of its people. The landing will officially open back up for the 2022 season on March 1st, 2022. The hours are Tuesday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. each day, and we're located at 100 South Jefferson Street in Jefferson City, just down the hill from the Missouri State Capitol. So not only are we doing our virtual program series here with Daniel Boone Regional Library, it's also our busy school tour season that coincides with our state's legislative session. From now until May, we give tours of the Missouri State Capitol building several times a day with prior reservation. Of course, if you prefer to not make a reservation ahead of time, you're welcome to take part in a self-guided tour at any time during the building's operating hours of 8 to 5, Monday through Friday, and 9 to 4 on weekends. Um, we'll post a link for making a Capitol tour reservation in the chat, and I can do that in a little bit. <laughs> Okay, um, for, of course, with schools being active, our traveling trunk program has continued to pick up steam. We offer a variety of traveling trunks for reservation, including Missouri's native people, Lewis and Clark, reptiles and amphibians, and our brand new, just released prehistoric Missouri trunk, which is guaranteed to be a crowd pleaser for the young dinosaur lovers in your life. And I definitely have a couple of those myself, so <laughs> they'll be very excited. Trunks include activities, lesson plans, and amazing artifacts, which encourage hands-on interaction. Trunks can be reserved by teachers, educators, homeschool parents, event coordinators, or even just regular parents looking for something super cool to do with the kids on a rainy weekend. You can see the trunks we have to offer on our website, linked in the chat, 
Again, I will supply that link uh, later on. And contact us via our education. Oh, thank you, Carrie. Our via our education email to check availability. I don't believe our prehistoric Missouri trunk is listed on the website yet, but it is now preservable. It should be hopefully listed on the website soon. I did uh, photograph it and things like that recently. So soon. Um, we have been taking great strides in promoting inclusion and accessibility to meet the needs of every person that visits. So one of our most anticipated new additions to the Missouri State Museum and Jefferson Landing site is that we have established a sensory kit, checked checkout option for our visitors in both locations. <clears throat> These sensory kits are available upon request at our main desk. The State Museum staff has also gained certification for our sites as an autism friendly business through the Thompson Center for Autism and Neurodevelopment Disorders at Missouri University. So we're proud to have become a small part of this outstanding organization. Ooh, okay. <laughs> so now <clears throat> that's what I had for announcements from our museum. And Carrie, it looks like has supplied the links in the chat. So I will begin sharing my screen and my presentation. Can everyone see my, awesome, thank you, Lauren. Okay, so here we go. Um, so thank you all again for joining me for my presentation. I called Magic and Monsters, the Life, Art, and Imagination of Rose O'Neill. I know technically yesterday was Valentine's Day, but I thought I would start my presentation off by showing you all one of Rose O'Neill's more romantic works of art. So this piece pictured here is one of her graphite and watercolor works, and it's titled Paolo and Francesca. And it was painted roughly around the year 1911, but it tells the story of a tragic romance, one that was originally told in Dante's Inferno, where Francesca, who's part of an unhappy union, falls in love with her husband's younger brother, Paolo. Um, spoiler alert, this love affair ultimately leads to their tragic deaths. So like Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, the story of Paolo and Francesca belongs to a tradition of tragic romances stretching all the way back to antiquity. Rose O'Neill, through her art, liked to tell stories. She was a self-trained artist who periodically lived in the Missouri Ozarks throughout her adult life. This is where we see the connection between Rose and Missouri which I'll elaborate on a little more later, in my, later on in my presentation. Um, embodying what I think anyway, the true sense of what it means to be a trailblazer, Rose O'Neill built a successful career as a magazine and book illustrator, and at a young age became the best known and highest paid female commercial illustrator in the United States. She is most widely recognized for her creation of the QB who up until Walt Disney's Mickey Mouse first made his appearance was the most widely known cartoon character at that time. While my presentation does not aim to overlook the significance of her cute cherub characters and the fortune and international fame she inherited from creating cupies, I do seek to interpret some of Rose's more fantastical and mythological art which I hope reveals to all of you a different side to her artistic personality. In her biological sketch, we find Rose frequently traveled while putting down roots in a few different states. She was born in Pennsylvania, but grew up in Nebraska, which is where her family moved to live on a farm before eventually moving to outside Omaha. When she was 17, she traveled and lived with nuns in New York City. And that's where she began her career as paid illustrator. And after being there for a year or so, she traveled for the first time to the Missouri Ozarks, which is where her family had relocated. And Rose instantly fell in love with the area. And for the rest of her life, she continued to split her time in many places, but she always returned to the Ozarks. However, jumping back to a time before her found love for the Ozarks and looking a little bit more in depth at Rose's early life, Rose was born in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania to William Patrick, and this one's a mouthful, Alice Cecilia Asmus Smith O'Neill, 
or as she was typically referred to, or shorter version, Mimi, <laughs> which I'll stick with from now on. <laughs> Her parents were noted to be extremely progressive and idealistic in personality. William owned a bookshop. Um, however, his career as a bookseller failed early on in Rose's life. And to avoid debt collectors, he moved the family to Nebraska, where they could live on a farm. So stories indicate William had this fantasy of being a farmer who had all the time in the world to just sit around and read books. Um, but ultimately, he did not understand the difficult work involved with keeping up a farm. Sources indicate William was a major influence, however, on his children, um, encouraging their imagination. Um, but not thinking so much of their formal education. William was first generation Irish and his Irish cultural influence um, can be seen in some of Rose's artwork depicting characters from Celtic mythology. Meanwhile, Rose's mother Mimi worked as a teacher for much of Rose's early life and proved to be uh, the more pra practical parent at times. Um, she was also a major influence um, to her children musically, um, so she really helped stem their love for music. Rosa Neal was a completely self-taught artist. She started drawing at the age of three, and she, early on she learned to draw anatomy from art books, and she studied John Flaxman's illustrations in Homer's The Iliad and The Odyssey. Um, as well as Gustave Doré's imagery in Dante's Inferno. Some of her pieces I'll show you here in a little bit illustrate Rose's um, inspiration from mythology and classics. Her father brought with them from Pennsylvania many books from his days as a bookseller. So the O'Neill Home Library held quite an extensive collection of literature. Aside from literary inspiration, however, her family served as her live models and she drew them for practice as well. When Rose was 13, her mother encouraged her to enter one of her drawings in a contest sponsored by the Omaha World Herald newspaper. She titled her drawing, Temptation Leading Down Into an Abyss. And I just think that screams young teen angst if nothing else. Um, and it's actually pictured here. So this uh, drawing you're seeing here was the one that she entered into the contest. Um, however, the judges did not believe that she could produce such a moving piece, so they requested that Rose come to the office and then they had her draw a drapery that was in the office um, to prove that she had in fact drawn this piece. And so Rose did this and she rightfully won the contest. Um, and in fact, Rose left such an impression on them that afterwards, one of the judges took her under his wing and taught her how to make uh, plates for reproduction. <clears throat> With recognition from her award from the Omaha World Herald newspaper, she received work from the Omaha World Herald itself, as well as the Omaha Excelsior and the Chicago Juvenile. Um, and so this, this work early on, this early illustration work, really encouraged her to continue making art into uh, later in life. Her brother Edward died shortly after Rose uh, won the drawing contest, and sources indicate he would eventually become the true basis for her QP character that she later on develops in life. At the age of 17, Rose met and fell in love with Bray Latham of Virginia. He was the son of Major Woodville Latham, who was a professor and a chemist, um, and he served as an officer in the Confederate Army during the American Civil War. Gray and his family were responsible in collaboration with the Edison Company for transforming the kinetoscope into the technology for motion pictures. And he actually worked uh, as a director for some of the first films ever made. Their long distance courtship continued for several years. Meanwhile, William O'Neill hoped his daughter would become a stage actress and strongly encouraged her to pursue this profession. Her father helped her get some acting jobs with a touring theater company. However, once he recognized her true talent and passion for drawing, he promoted Rose as an artist and assisted her in landing several different illustrating jobs. Um, as she got busier with art, she just stopped acting altogether. At the age of 19, Rose moved to New York City, where she lodged at the French convent 
of the Sisters of St. Regis. She had a portfolio of illustrations and she would make rounds in the city vis visiting different editors and publishers. Um, it's important, however, to keep in mind the historical context of Rose's situation here. The field of illustration was male dominated during this period. Rose was making her way through, it was the Edwardian era. So like most professions during this period, women had to sometimes conceal their gender by signing works under different names or their initials. And in Rose's case, she did use R.C. O'Neill for a while. And just kind of like a random little fact I found out when doing my research is that before the truth came out that she was a woman, she was of course assumed to be a male illustrator, um, Rose received all kinds of letters from other women. And some of these letters would contain locks of the sender's hair as sort of this romantic gesture. And I just thought that was such a bizarre uh, thing I came across. But um, ultimately concealing her gender afforded her more creative opportunities. However, Rose uh, obviously went on to become one of the best illustrators of the time. And she also began selling her work regularly. Rose was quoted saying, I'm in love with magic and monsters. And I think you'll find this to be evident as we begin looking at some of her work in these next few slides. This ink and watercolor we're seeing pictured here is titled Perseus with the Head of Medusa. And it was painted sometime between 1900 and 1920. I realize that's like a 20 year age gap, but the exact date of this piece is not known. Um, so it's kind of in that range somewhere. Most of us, even those who are uninterested in mythology, have at least heard of or maybe seen some sort of depiction of Medusa. Modern interpretations in popular uh, films such as Clash of the Titans or Percy Jackson uh, films and books depict Medusa as this terrifying and cruel monster with snakes for hair. We learn little of her actual uh, character. Um, However, I'm mentioning this because I think it shows the significant impact mythology had on Rose's art. But in Ovid's Metamorphosis, the myth with Medusa, she's first a human who then becomes a victim of sexual assault by the Olympian god of the sea, Poseidon. And this heartbreaking incident takes place in the temple of Athena. However, rather than punishing Poseidon, Athena punished Medusa by turning her into a gorgon. And if you ever read mythology, it's there's a lot of uh, tragic incidents like that. But um, the scene being depicted in Rose's piece is the Greek hero Perseus holding the severed head of Medusa. And my interpretation of this piece is that Medusa is not a monster, but in fact, she's beautiful. And rather than looking terrifying, she kind of looks at peace to me, like she can finally rest now from this horrible um, curse that was put upon her by Athena. This next piece is a graphite ink and watercolor on paper, and it's titled Peasants Chastising a Fawn. In Roman mythology, a fawn is a creature that's part human and part goat. It's akin to a Greek satyr, if you're more familiar with Greek mythology. But here we have a group of peasants who appear to be berating this young fawn, who just looks entirely defeated. Um, and so I think what Rose was trying to get across with this piece is kind of making you wonder like who here in this piece is actually the monster. Here we're seeing a graphite drawing of a centaur, which is a creature from Greek mythology with the upper body of a human and the lower body and legs of a horse. So I hope you all don't mind my little side excursion into ancient myth, but so much of Rose's artwork seems to be somewhat influenced by mythology. So I thought it seemed relevant to share some of her pieces with you here. During her year in New York, Rose's family moved to the Missouri Ozarks. She took a train to Springfield and then a wagon trail of approximately 50 miles to get to this home. Um, instantly, she fell in love with the Ozarks and she would return to this home and this place for essentially the rest of her life. Um, during this trip to Missouri, she called the family home Bonnie Brook and did many drawings there. She sold all of them and began working with increasingly more magazines at this time. In 1896, she became the first female illustrator for the humor magazine Puck. The same year, she also was published in the magazine Truth 
and her piece was the first published cartoon strip by a woman in the United States. However, during her time in the Ozarks, Rose created a character that would come to leave behind a lasting legacy. And I think you all know of which one I'm referring to. Rose O'Neill is best known for the Cupid doll. Even though she had already been working for two decades as an extremely popular comic, romance, and advertising illustrator well before the doll appeared. Ultimately, the popularity of the doll overshadowed her complete body of work, causing her to be excluded from recognition in most art, illustration, and comic history books. Um, this picture I took of a Cupid doll on display at the Museum of the Puppetry Arts Institute, which is located in Independence, Missouri. I was actually there researching another trailblazer, the puppeteer Hazel Rollins, who I'll be presenting a program on later this fall. But the Cupid doll, however, actually emerged as a result of Rose's comics. The first Cupies appeared in the December 1909 issue of Ladies Home Journal and were long and skinny. So they weren't the cute, chubby, cherub characters that we normally think of. Um, they looked a little different in their first appearance. She soon signed a, a long-term contract with Women's Home Companion, and the Cupies appeared first in the September 1910 issue. Uh, this series started a craze which created a licensing frenzy, and so Rose had to hire a licensing agent, and she hired, hired uh, Otis Wood. And Otis hired George Borgfeld and company to develop a Cupie doll. When Rose received the first model of the doll, the company had not used her model and they cast their own instead. So she went to the factory in Germany, which is where they were being made, and she made uh, 12 QB dolls in different sizes on her own. And the QB doll officially received a patent on March 4th, 1913. And the demand for the dolls was so high that the German factory could not handle the workload. Um, it took factories in six different countries actually to fill the orders for these dolls. Um, and the QB craze lasted until roughly World War II. And actually, Anne Frank is reported uh, receiving a Cupid doll in her diary in December of 1942. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of how long uh, people stayed interested in getting these Cupid dolls, roughly 1913 to 1942, we can say. Um, it was the first novelty toy distributed around the world, and the Cupid doll made Rose, Rose O'Neill essentially a millionaire. So. The Cupid character is a baby version of the God of Attraction and Affection, Cupid. And this piece here is ink on cardstock and the date of this piece is unknown, but it's titled The Lost Cherub. So again, we're seeing the connection between Rose's artwork and classical mythology, even with her most popular and iconic creation, the Cupid. Um, however, her brother Edward, who died at a young age is said to be the true basis for her Cupid character. While living with her sister Callista for a time in New York City's Greenwich Village, Rose became involved with the women's suffrage movement. In a sense, Rose was always concerned with women's equality. Even in her younger years, when she spoke out against the um, constriction of corsets and stated women should be wearing more comfortable and flowing dresses, um, in a campaign to introduce her novel art garb, Rose is quoted saying, the first step is to free women from the yoke of modern fashions and modern dress. How can they hope to compete with men when they are boxed up tight in the clothes that are worn today? Um, however, during the women's suffrage movement, Rose took her advocacy to an even more effective level when she marched in parades and gave speeches and illustrated posters for the movement. Rose used the QBs to discuss her specific ideas about society and social conditions. She created a street exhibition, which took place at Broadway and 42nd Street. As a suffragette and artist, Rose took advantage of the QB's popularity to advance the political movement. Her pieces for this exhibition noted the negative impact the lack of voting rights placed on young women, and it emphasized the important role women played in society and family life. Rose was able to witness her efforts. 
along with those of countless other women, take hold when, after passing through Congress on June 4th, 1919, and after receiving the necessary approval of three-fourths of the states on August 18th, 1920, the 19th Amendment was officially and finally ratified by the U.S. Secretary of State on August 26th, 1920, which states, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. As the QBs continued taking on a life of their own, Rose began developing some uh, somatic work she titled Sweet Monsters. Um, however, with the economic toll of the Great Depression and Rose's Sweet Monsters not achieving the anticipated popularity like that of the QBs, she lost nearly all of her savings. Rose spent most of her time later in life living at the Bonnie Brook House where she began reflecting on her life and writing her memoirs. In 1943, Rose suffered a stroke that paralyzed half of her body, and she died on April 6, 1944 in Springfield, Missouri. Rose O'Neill entered the golden age of illustration at a time when women artists and illustrators were just being accepted into a male-dominated field. Her story is captivating and awe-inspiring the fact that she accomplished as much as she did when she did it is something to learn. QPs are a legacy in themselves, but when you look at how prolific she was as an illustrator, I think the case can be made. Rose O'Neill was without a doubt a trailblazer through and through. And here are some of the sources that I used uh, for my research, but also that I recommend if you're interested in learning more about Rose O'Neill um, to check out. So thank you very much. Okay, we're going to open things up for uh, if anybody has any comments or questions. I have a couple, if that's okay to start off with, Angela. I'm trying, sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to stop sharing. Bear with me just a second. You can go ahead and ask me, Pam. Okay. Uh, do you have a favorite piece of art by... Rose O'Neill herself that you enjoy? Um, I was kind of thinking about this a lot as I was looking at her different pieces. Um, and I really love, it's not a favorite piece, but it's a collection and it's her Sweet Monsters collection, um, which I had shown uh, one of her pieces was the centaur that was part of her Sweet Monsters collection. Um, so you can do a quick Google search. Um, I want to say it's uh, History on the Square, maybe, in Springfield, Missouri, that has, they did, formerly did an exhibit on it, or they currently have an exhibit, um, and they have uh, pictures um, from this collection, and also uh, just a lot of great information about each piece, so I would say her Sweet Monsters collection is my favorite. Okay, what, uh, where are we able to view some of Rose's artwork today? We are lucky that we're in Missouri. Um, so we have the option of going to Bonnie Brook Home and Museum, which is located in Walnut Shade, Missouri. Um, and so we have this really cool opportunity to actually get this amazing Rose O'Neill experience. So I definitely recommend that since we're in Missouri um, to go uh, check out some of the pieces they have on display there, but then also just to check out Bonnie Brook, which had such a significant uh, meaning to her life and she drew so many things there and created so many things there and wrote her memoirs there so um, it truly would be the best experience I think. Okay what did you enjoy most in researching the life and artwork of Rose O'Neill? I think it probably showed <laughs> um, but I'm currently working on a project on mythology behind some of the sculpture art in the Capitol building. So while I was researching Rose O'Neill and I came across the fact that she did so much uh, mythological inspired art, it just really, it made me feel a connection with her. And um, I knew I really wanted to focus on some of those pieces that she did. I was just curious, do you know exactly how old her brother was when he passed away? or 
I don't know the age, but I do know that he was young because the idea was he was kind of like this little baby, like he lives on forever as a baby. Um, so I don't know his exact age or if he was in fact an infant or maybe a toddler, I'm not sure, but I do know that he was very young uh, in age when he passed. Is there anything that you might want to share with us that you, you didn't with your presentation? I well I would recommend if you're interested in really getting Rose's perspective on things I recommend uh reading her memoirs um they're very detailed and she wrote them you know after she had all these experiences and kind of towards the end of her life and so it's really her like reflecting back on a younger version of herself and um so that so that's what I would that's what I would recommend Lauren, would you like to ask? Sure. I I just she was amazingly talented, and I um uh, the fact that she was one hundred percent self taught is phenomenal to me. I as someone who has zero <laughs> zero uh, artistic ability, that she was there any documentation at any point in her life after she started to gain um, uh, attention as an illustrator that she sought out any instruction, or did she just keep doing her own thing? You know, she started so young and I think the encouragement from her parents, because her, her parents, well, and it was probably mostly her father. I'm not saying her mother didn't encourage her, but when it came to like literature and the arts, um, he really encouraged their imagination. So I don't, I don't know that it was ever necessarily a needed thing. I think she was just kind of from the get-go, always like practicing her art and interested in it and always knew she was going to kind of be doing it. So that's the impression I got anyway. Um, she did an exhibit and this was after Cupies, I think. Um, so she was pretty well known at that point um, in Paris. And I think she received, it was not formal instruction, but I think she received some insight maybe from some artists over there, if I remember reading that correctly, but nothing was, there was no formal art school degree or anything like that. She was just, she just took her uh, pencil to paper and went for it. She did a great job. Do you still have a couple pieces of her work there in the resource hall of the Missouri State Museum? We have, there's a piece in the Trailblazers exhibit. Um, I wish I had included photos of that in there. Um, if you come in, it's like a storybook that's on the wall and it's great for kids it's part of the trailblazers exhibit you can come in and flip through this storybook about her life um and one thing i did want to point out because he's another famous missouri artist is thomas hart benton um is quoted saying that she's one of the best illustrators he's ever seen and actually she was very uh hospitable of a person and she would <laughs> uh like artists would come and visit her house. And I believe this was her Connecticut house. I'm not sure it was the Bonnie Brook. It might've been her one in Connecticut. Um, but Thomas Hart Benton actually came and stayed at her house for a while among other artists. Uh, it was just kind of, she was just known for being very, very hospitable. Um, and so if you flip through that book in our exhibit, you'll see a quote by Thomas Hart Benton at the end there, so. That's fantastic. Um, does anybody else have a comment or a question that they would like to ask? Lauren, are you seeing anything that I'm missing? I am not. Yeah, my, I think you already answered the question I had, which is where, you know, where we could see her work. So um, Bonnie Brook Historical Society, right? Yeah, and I wanna say that I think, or at least in 2021, there was an exhibit at UMSL University of Missouri, St. Louis. I don't know that it's still going on. That was in April of 2021 that I know it had started. So it, I'm assuming it is likely still there, um, uh, but that's something to look into too if you're in the St. Louis area and you wanna see some of her work. Okay, well, uh... Angela, I want to thank you again for sharing your time and expertise with us this afternoon. I'm going to throw it over to Lauren. She has a couple of things that people might be interested in. I just now see a question in the chat from uh, Marilyn McLeod asking about um, 
about the QP mascot here in Columbia, uh, Hickman High School has the QP as a mascot. And if there was any information about the origin of that. Um, I, I don't know about the origin of it. I do know that it's the only school that has a QP for a mascot. <laughs> um, I'm not sure exactly what the connection is um, historically. Um, I, the, the story that I, I have a child that goes to Hickman and the story that that they I think talk about is that there was a um, there was a basketball game held in 1913 and the school secretary had a QP doll and she put it at the center of the court before the basketball game as like a good luck thing and then they won and somehow it just kind of stuck um, so I don't know if that's apocryphal or if that's actually true but it had something to do with it being a good luck charm for an important game oh, um, in, in the early 1900s yeah. that's awesome yeah. Um, yeah. So it's a fun mascot. Definitely. Very unique. Yes. Very, very unique. Um, so we will, uh, I think, as Pam mentioned, we are going to be um, taking a break uh, for the Trailblazers program for a little while until June. We'll start back up again. But I did want to let you know about a couple of programs that history buffs might be interested in. We are doing a program called Founding Mothers, Establishing Library Services in Columbia. And that's on Wednesday, February 23rd at 7 p.m. We are doing that as a hybrid event, so you can register to come in person. We have limited seats for that. Um, or you can register uh, to attend via Zoom. And I'll go ahead and put uh, the link in the chat here. And um, so we are celebrating at the Columbia Public Library, the headquarters of DBRL. We're celebrating our 100th anniversary this year, our centennial. And um, this, the library would not have been founded without a women's organization called the Tuesday Club and then with a great deal of input from the League of Women Voters, um, the local league to help us pass our first tax levy. So um, that program will look at, at the vital roles played by these women in the creation of the library. And then there's another program coming up in March as part of Women's History Month. This year's theme is Providing Healing, Promoting Hope. And so we are going to take a look at the women pioneers at MU School of Medicine, 1900 to 1908. Again, that's Tuesday, March 29th at noon, and that will be online via Zoom. Um, Dr. Betsy Garrett, she's going to share her research about the earliest female graduates from the University of Missouri School of Medicine, starting with um, Anna Searcy, who earned her degree in 1900. So that should be a good presentation. We don't have it up on our um, online calendar yet, but you can always visit uh, dbrl.org, um, our events page, and take a look and, and see what we've got coming up and go, go to the calendar there. And that's it for me, Pam. Okay, thank you, Lauren. Again, we want to thank everyone for joining us today. And thank you, Angela. We appreciate that. It was a great program. Everyone, try to enjoy the sunshine today and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.